Welcome to my garden. I'm Liz Davey and you're watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television. This show is done in episodes once or twice a month throughout the year, showcasing my gardens. Uh, I have both an herb garden, perennials, shade garden, and vegetable garden. And also we do some cooking inside, hopefully with some of the produce that we are able to take out of the garden, and in the winter, just some holiday treats. Today I'm out at the herb garden, and uh, it's winter. It's December, early December, and it should be cold and snowy like it was last week. However, today it's almost 60 degrees. That's New England weather for you. Tomorrow we wish we'll have a nice covering of snow, but we're out enjoying it today while it lasts. We have had snow right after Thanksgiving on December 1st. We got bombed with snow and it melted night before last and last night. And so here we are again in the garden with no snow, but we have plenty of leaves covering uh, the garden. These are mostly oak leaves and they provide a lot of protection for some of the plant's roots. They also give a nice spot for various uh, beneficial insects to spend the winter. I've cut down most of the uh, annuals and removed them, but I've left most of the perennial herbs standing. Again, those stems provide a little housing spot for some of the little smaller creatures in the garden. We can still pick some sage. We can still pick a little thyme if we get it out from under the leaves, but that's about it for the herb garden at this point. I was able to get out on Thanksgiving and pick a few things before the snow hit. But after the snow hit, of course, when it's covered with snow, we don't get anything. I do try to get outside, though, every day, whether it's snow or not. There are always some things to do in the garden. Picking up sticks and pine cones is one of them. When you have a lot of trees, you have a lot of sticks. So I do come out and try to gather some of the sticks and perhaps cut down a few things around along the way. Right now, I've been out taking cuttings of plants for my decorations and you'll see more of that later when we go inside and make a few Christmas decorations using some of the things that we were able to pick out of the garden. Let's move over to the perennials. Again I have uh, left most of my perennials standing. Some of them still have some seed heads on them and those seed heads can also help feed some of the birds. The birds have been really busy at the feeders but they also like some of the seed heads that are left in the garden. Black-eyed Susans, the uh, other things that are left, some of the grasses have seeds that give nutrition to the birds. I've covered a few of the tender things with a little bit of straw in addition to the leaves, and that will be all removed in the spring. I did cut down my irises. I don't like cutting those in the spring. Most of the time I cut down the grasses. I don't like cutting those in the spring much either, but this year the snow came before I got around to it. But the irises did get cut. Uh, Siberian iris particularly gets kind of nasty to cut in the spring. And also it doesn't like to have none of the irises like a lot of wet on them in the winter. So by taking off the foliage we help prevent that. As I move along, we come to a rose and that has a layer of compost around the roots. I've done that to all of the roses and that will help protect the roots and where it comes up out of the garden. I've used baskets on lavenders and chrysanthemums in the garden and they are filled with oak leaves and hopefully they will protect those little more tender plants. We are a zone six on the USDA plant scale. However, some areas of my garden I think are closer to a five because it, uh, the wind kind of rolls into certain areas. So some of the plants need a little bit more protection. I've picked some sedum and pick a few more. The sedum heads make nice Christmas decorations in some of my outdoor pots. You can spray them with gold or silver or even uh, 
burgundy paint, if you wish. They are now naturally a burgundy color, and they turn kind of a brown in the winter, but they make a nice addition to the winter arrangements. Seed pods are sometimes good, too, if you don't want things to go to seed. And you can add the seed pods, and these, too, can be sprayed different colors, if you wish. These are uh, butterfly weed, and they've all gone to seed, so they're completely empty at this point. But they can, again, when they're dried, they're kind of decorative. I got these a little bit too late for their decorative value, but uh, the birds have probably consumed all of the seeds by now. Moving over to this one, this is a red twig dogwood. And again, that makes a good decoration. And it does need to be pruned. So by pruning it, you're actually helping it. And I use that as a high accent in various arrangements. It becomes redder if you keep it young growth. Uh, older growth tends to turn brown. This is a piece that's a little older. This one's a little younger, and you can see the difference in color. And we are starting to get a few raindrops. We may be cut short here. Other things I've left up, and again, baskets over lavenders and chrysanthemums. We're hoping this little raindrop stops soon. I think it might. Now let's move over to the vegetable garden. Vegetables are gone. Uh, the vegetable garden has mostly been plowed. I have straw over the strawberries, over the garlic that was planted in October, and also over the parsley that was left. I was able to pick parsley for our Thanksgiving dinner and still have some in the refrigerator. So that would be probably my last crop from the garden, except for a few onions and, of course, the garlic that are in storage. Raspberries are also not plowed up, and they will be pruned in the spring, as will the blueberries which brings me to blueberries and lilacs, which also make good Christmas decorations if you want to use branches, and they too can be sprayed. The blueberry branches are, have a slight red to them, but both blueberries and lilacs are kind of twiggy, which makes an interesting counterpoint in a floral arrangement. Now, let's head back to the shade garden before the rain starts too much. As you can see, I've built a large arrangement in this flower pot. The, of course, the flowers that were here have been taken out. We had some uh, canna lilies, and those are resting inside. And we'll spend the winter there and then come back out when the temperatures get considerably warmer. Today is warm enough that I can poke in these sedums, I think, at least around the edge. It's a little warmer. Most of these I filled early, fortunately, because with the snow. And then I'll put in a few pods as well, if there's anything left for the birds. But you can see the red twig dogwood gives some nice height to the arrangement. And then these are just pine pieces that I've picked around the garden. Holly that I've picked from my holly bushes. And I have one that's almost a tree. I guess it is a tree at this point and always needs a little pruning. Uh, surprisingly, the holly that the deer pruned really well last year, because I forgot to deer spray it, uh, resulted in a lot of berries this year. So I guess pruning really helps with the berry production. I've also put in aliums, and these are onion relatives that go to seed and form this nice little round bloom that uh, is where the seeds are. There's still a few seeds in this one here and there. Anyway, they uh, are start out as a bulb, and then they flower, and they usually are blue or purple, and then the seed head forms, and I save them and spray them with a little gold paint, and they make a nice accent for either indoor or outdoor decorations. They will not last outdoors as well, but we'll have more next year, so we don't worry about that. A variety of greens is nice. This one is Lakothwe. And that's a bush that I also grow. It's also an evergreen, but it has a little different leaf 
uh, than the needled evergreens, so it makes a nice accent in their arrangements too. Now let's move back quickly to the pond. It seems to have let up with the rain. Just picked a stick out of the pond. Uh, there is no ice in the pond. It has been iced over pretty well and my fish are coming out. I have a flue tile in the bottom of the pond and they love to hang out in there when it's cold. But today being a little warmer, almost up to 60 degrees, they are now out and uh, looking around a little. They're still pretty slow because the water is still pretty cold but they're doing more swimming than I've seen them do for quite a while. But they go in and out of the flue tile that's at the bottom. They seem to hang out in there pretty well. I have my ice melter. It has worked well. Keeps a hole in the ice so that any gases that are formed can exhaust and don't build up and kill the fish. So hopefully the fish will stick around. I think you can probably see the fish. They're up near the top a little bit. We even had a frog jump in and he's hanging out over by the rocks. Uh, this is the latest I think I've ever seen a frog out and jumping in the pool. Usually they're kind of buried down in the mud by now and spending the winter. Again, I've been putting up my decorations and my house stays warm enough to work if there's sun. Uh, I have a max min thermometer in there and it'll go down about the same as outdoors at night. But if there's sun on the window on the side of it, uh, it'll go up to 80 or 90 during the day. So it's kind of pleasant to come out and work there when the sun's out. But when the sun isn't out, it's about the same as outdoor temperatures. Again, I do try to get out each day. I check the pond to make sure there's a hole in the ice and also check temperatures and check that the mice haven't damaged anything inside the shed. Uh, I do keep a mouse trap in there, so I have to check that periodically too. But as far as garden work, there's not a whole lot to do except pick up sticks and pine cones. My brush pile's growing and it's uh, going to be large by the time we get to brush burning season, which actually starts the end of January, but we usually don't do the brush burning until much later than that. I think our raindrops are back, so let's head on inside, make a few decorations, and do some holiday baking. Okay, today, the first thing I'm going to do today is a wreath. And I've already started, I purchased the wreath, and then I have wired in or poked into the framework of the wreath some greens that I picked in the garden. A little arbovitae, a little hemlock, a little white pine, just to give it a little extra. You could also tuck in other things that you might have in your garden. Now I'm going to give it a good hanger. A lot of times a wreath will come with just a little wire that usually holds the price tag. And it's not much of a hanger. But you determine where you want the top to be. And then I'm using a co covered wire, <coughs> which is a little stronger. And I'm going to twist that around the wreath and then make a nice holder by twisting it together at the top. So that will be my top. <coughs> you can put some greens over it, but it still remains the top. And you can work from there. And then I have a variety of things to add to it that uh, came from the craft store. So I'm going to start by just kind of laying them on in a pattern. And I've purchased three, three of each of the several items. And these usually have a, a wire on the back that you can bend. If not, you can just use a piece of the green wire. But you can often poke these right into the arrangement and they will stay. And I'm gonna fan that one out a little bit. And then this one I'm gonna put in the middle and again try to put it right through the center of the wreath. And perhaps since it's on the bottom, I can just poke that wire up to hold it in place. And another one over on this side. And again, we want to get it right into the center of the wreath. Later when you hold it up, if you need to add a little of the green, this is called paddle wire and it's available at craft stores, as are all 
these other items. And then I have some holly and berries to give it a little color. And these two we can stick right in. And probably we'll definitely want to either wire these or bend them to make sure that they stay in place. And this has a nice bendy wire on it. We can just curl it right around the base of the wreath. We'll put one of those at each of these spots. And again, we can curl it around underneath the greens. And then I thought I'd add a little uh, color with some wired gold sprayed and glittered cones. And again, the wire can go kind of under the greens and tightly around and fasten in back. Yeah, those are in place. And now it's time to finish it off. We have our hanger up here, so we'll put a, a nice bow on it. And we did some bow making, I think, last year or year before. But you can either purchase a bow or learn to make one yourself. Plenty of instructions online. And last but not least, I want to finish it off with a red bird. And I'm going to fasten him to one of the greens. And he'll probably need a little better wire. Well, maybe not. Hopefully it'll just perch there nicely. So that's our holiday wreath that can be hung outside on the door. Uh, we're shedding a little bit already. Clean those off and I'll put that over here and we will make an arrangement for inside. And for that, I have soaked a piece of the Oasis. Uh, this foam, floral foam, is available at craft stores. It comes in two types. One is for dry arrangements and one is for wet. The wet one is called Oasis and the dry one's called Sahara. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. But you want to get the right one because if you try to soak the dry one, it will not take up and hold water at all. And I've put some blueberry branches in here that I've sprayed white. And then I'm going to add some greens. And I'll be cutting those to fit in. And I basically want to cover the base first. And then add some at the top. And this is Arbavite off one of my bushes that always needs a little pruning. And I'll cover the base part first a little bit with that. The idea is that you don't really want to see that oasis, but it is there to add some water for these greens that I'm putting in and to keep them fresh throughout the holiday season. Yeah. And then we'll add some pieces of white pine too. And Just basically start filling in with various greens. 
large and small pieces. This is going on the dining room table and there is a just rule of thumb, it's not hard and fast, but you want your arrangement to be approximately no taller than your hand if you put your elbow on the table. That way you can see who's, who you're having dinner with across the table. So we'll try to keep this to that level. There's some more white pine over here. smaller pieces and then I have a lot of other greens down here further down including some more of the trimmings from my yard I'll turn it as I go a little bit And then I want to add a few sprigs of holly to this as well. I can also add a few things like poppy pods. I'm going to just cut a few of those off. These are the poppy seeds or, or seed holders. The seeds have long gone, but I sprayed them with gold paint. Just went out one day and sprayed a lot of things with gold. And we can also add some pine cones, again, that I sprayed. And these are, are wired to sticks, fairly long sticks, so we can poke those right in. And I'll probably have more holly to add. And what else do we have? A little hemlock, which is yet another green from the garden. It's nice if you're making an arrangement to try to have three different, if you're using uh, holiday greens, try to have three different ones. It gives a little variation to the arrangement. And so there we have a little table arrangement, which I'm going to put over here for now. And I think I need to add a little right there. You have to look at it from a distance sometimes to see what needs to be added. I could also add a bird or another decoration to this. There's so many options. We also can add gold balls or beads. I can add a few of these uh, for a little extra. color. Let's see if I have another good one wired. I keep my decorations from year to year so that we have a variety available. And again, I've wired these Christmas ornaments to picks so they can be tucked in to the arrangement. right in there. So it's pretty easy to build a centerpiece if you have a few things and, and a lot of greens in your garden to choose from. The next thing I'm going to do is a basket and the basket is going to be going out on my front porch. I think I've got all the greens off of that one. And I'm going to use some of the red twig dogwood as a framework in this basket because I want it to be good sized. It sits outside my garden. And so I have some tall elements, so the tall branch elements. And again, the oasis has been soaked. And I used a whole piece in this one. And there's plenty of room for water. And then I'll start filling in around it. 
top and bottom. For this, I have quite a bit of the arborvitae, and uh, we'll take some of the pieces off the bottom and then put some of the ones in the top. To fill it in. I really want to fill this basket up with greenery, and I'm going to keep rocking around it so that I see where I am. And that one has to be turned. Once you put something into the oasis, it kind of locks the pores on the plant. So always cut off if you've put a piece in and taken it out to reposition it. Just cut off a piece of the stem so that it has a fresh spot to take up a little water. And we have a little bit of white pine left, which we will put in. The arrangement will sit. These don't need to take up water. The arrangement is going to sit facing forward, so I want to really work on the front side of it. And the back side can kind of be a little less full as it will sit up against the wall out on my front entry. Then I'll fill in with some of the hemlock. It's a little messy. As you can see, we tend to get things kind of all over the place. But it cleans up pretty well. If you get uh, pine sap on your hands, if you rub them with an oil like uh, Crisco or peanut butter, it'll wash off very easily. So it's a good Good thing to know when you're working with fresh greens because they do have pine sap in them. Let's see how we're doing here. Now I want to add holly, and I do have a little more holly to add to this one. I knew there were a couple small pieces down in the bottom of the bucket. I also have Lakothway. Again, gives some variation. And I saved out a few very large holly sprigs to kind of go in the, in the front and the top. And I need to come around front. A piece of cedar, another native plant, eastern red cedar. I'm going to finish the basket off before I put it out on the porch with another wreath, and this one will match the wreath that I have on the front of the house, which is this year black and white. So I have kind of a black and white and red color theme. And again, I've made the wreath and we'll just wire it to the handle of the basket. This one is a little bit out of the weather as it's under a, a roof area, so it should hold up a little longer. And we can rearrange our ties a little bit. And the bow itself. No matter how much you try, they get a little messed up when they're waiting but with the wired edges of the ribbon, they can be fluffed up again pretty easily. And so I'm gonna add a few more elements to this, and these are things I sprayed from the garden. These are astilbe blossoms, and I sprayed those with gold. Basically, just have fun. Get your elements together, and then you can just have fun with them. And I've got more of these uh, aliums and they're pretty tall, some of them. So I'll put a few tall ones in and a few thinner ones. Let's see, some of them are a little better looking than others. I have sedum that can go in as well. This gives a little more of the red. 
It's a matter of just accenting what's there with things you have. And these will go down front. And a little more of a gold accent. What do we have? Uh, just checking. I had a fern in here, I think. Yes. These are just common ferns, but this is the blossom on the fern, and it uh, looks very nice. It's nice and brown until you spray it gold, and then it adds a, a nice gold element. So there we are with a little accent and mostly greens from the garden for our basket that will go out in the entry. And you'll see uh, our centerpiece in the entry basket a little later in the show. Now let's go into the kitchen and cook up some holiday baking. We're going to start with some, do some holiday baking today, get ahead uh, a little bit and have some treats for the season. And I'm going to start out with the processor cake roll, which I have made before on one of my shows, but I'm repeating it because it's easy and it can be used in so many different ways. And I'm going to start out with four eggs in my food processor, and I'll add one cup of sugar, and I'm going to process this until it's pale and golden, and that's going to be about 90 seconds. So I'm going to use my timer and time it. Okay, now that they are light and you notice they've thickened a bit with the sugar and the eggs, again four eggs and one cup of sugar, and then I'm going to add, while it's running, a third of a cup of water and a teaspoon of vanilla. And we're just going to blend that in which we did. Now we'll add the dry ingredients, and the dry ingredients are a half cup of flour, one third cup of cocoa, and this is just regular cocoa in the brown can, and we want to add half a teaspoon of baking powder, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, and an eighth teaspoon of salt. Let me make sure I get it all out of the cup here. And then we're just going to pulse this to add it. No more than four or five pulses. And we have our cake batter, which is quite thin. And I'm going to add that to a jelly roll pan, which is a, what, 11 by 15. And this has been greased, and then a piece of parchment paper put in, and then that's been greased and floured. We want this all to come out at the end, and it will. We add the batter to the pan, and we're going to move it around to spread it out. in the sink. And we'll level it out to fill it up. This goes in the oven for 15 minutes at 375. And now while that's baking, we're going to prepare a towel, and this is a clean dish towel, and uh, I would like to stress uh, not a terry cloth towel. Uh, that isn't going to work too well because it probably will stick and you'll have terry cloth in your cake. So you want a, a smooth kitchen towel. And I'm going to coat this 
with confectioner's sugar. You could also use cocoa. I'm intending to frost this cake eventually, so I don't care what the outside of it looks like if it has a white on it, but as a chocolate cake, if you want it to stay brown, cocoa. Yes, your dish towel is going to get very dirty. Uh, I'd rather have mine white than brown, but it's personal preference at this point. So we'll wait until our cake comes out, and then we'll put it on the towel and roll it up. All right, our cake is finished. Time to turn off the timer and turn down the oven a little. The cake is pulled away from the sides of the pan, but just to make sure it's going to come out right. And again, we don't let it cool. I'm going to just go around it a little bit with a knife just to get the edges out. And then I'm going to flip this cake right onto the dish towel we've prepared. Straighten it up a little bit. Maybe, maybe not. And take off the parchment paper. Carefully just peel that off. And you have a nice thin cake layer. And we'll put this right in the sink. And then the next thing I'm going to do is use the towel. And we'll start at this end. And we're going to just roll this cake up while it's still warm into the towel. And then we'll put it aside to cool. And to wipe this a little bit so we can continue to work here. And we let the cake cool. And once it's cooled completely, I can fill the cake with whatever I'd like to fill it with. This one I filled with uh, a buttercream. You could also use ice cream. There's a lot of good seasonal ice creams out there these days. But you can see it still maintained its shape. A little powdered sugar on it. And then we can decorate it. And if you wish, if the edges are a little brown, you can cut them off. These are looking pretty good. But I'm going to put this on another plate, and what I want to do is cut it off a branch so that we have a branch against it. So I'm going to cut this at kind of an angle, and then I'll put it on the plate. You should be able to see kind of like a tree branch there, and then I have a, a branch coming this way. So we hope it looks like somewhat like a tree. This is a bouche de Noel, which is the French for a Christmas log. And then I'm going to frost it with some just chocolate frosting. And we'll frost both pieces. And because it's a uh, log. It doesn't have to be too smooth. Again, this has been chilling and having it chilled makes it a little easier to work with. And we'll give this a good layer too. If you're just making it as a dessert that you're going to cut and serve, then you wouldn't need to cut off and make a, a branch on the log necessarily. Because of the German buttercream that's in it, 
which does contain eggs. This will need to be refrigerated until it's served. Before you start a project like this, make sure you have room in the refrigerator. That's always, always a problem around here. If you wish to make it more accented as a log, I kind of like it the way it is, just kind of a rough with knife work on it. But you could also use a fork and run the fork along the log just to give it a little more texture. But I'm not going to do that. I am going to accent the cake though with a few things. And I have made some holly leaves and these were just chocolate cookies. And I put a little frosting on them for veins. I put a few here and there around it. And I've sugared some cranberries and I used some meringue powder to coat the cranberries. And I used frozen berries, it works better with fresh, and then some sparkling sugar. And this gives you a bit of a snow effect and uh, the cranberries add a little color. And are edible. You could also use cherries if you wished. And then the other thing that I can add to it are meringue mushrooms. Meringue is really easy to make. Uh, it's basically egg whites and sugar. And it's whipped together. Sometimes a little corn syrup is used. But basically, you make with a pastry bag a glob of meringue and a stem. They bake it in 200 oven for about two hours until they're very hard. I think you can probably hear. They're very hard and crisp. Then I coated the base with a, uh, made a little hole in the meringue in the top and coated it with chocolate and stuck in a little stem which I also made at the same time. And we can put some of these around. I uh, then dusted it with a little cocoa powder the nice thing about these, if you serve meringues and meringue mushrooms, they are gluten-free. And so anybody that can't have gluten can at least have a meringue mushroom. And add a few of those here and there. These will soften up in the refrigerator, so you need to serve the, put the mushrooms on shortly before you serve the dessert. And there is our Christmas Yule log. And you can see it's, it's not really hard to make. It looks a lot more impressive than it is difficult to make. Now we're gonna make some cookies. What's Christmas without cookies? And these are, are good ones. Uh, they're called melting snowman cookies, but that's mainly the decoration. And I'm gonna start with a half a cup of peanut butter, a half a cup of shortening, and then add half a cup of brown sugar and half a cup of white sugar. And I'm going to use my mixer and be, mix that together well. Scrape the bowl a little bit to get everything out of the bottom. Then I'm going to add some liquid ingredients, three tablespoons of milk, one egg, and a teaspoon of vanilla. And mix that in. And I'll scrape the bowl again. And then add some dry ingredients. And I'm adding one and a half cups flour and a quarter cup of cocoa. This is chocolate day, I guess. And then I need to add some leavening, and that would be an eighth teaspoon of baking soda, a teaspoon of baking powder, and just a pinch of salt. 
And we'll mix that in. And I'll scrape it one more time. It should pull away from the bowl pretty well and be entirely mixed by the time we're finished here. And I'm going to push the mixer back out of the way. And you can see we have the dough has uh, formed, come away from the sides of the bowl. It's very easy to work with. This will make about two dozen cookies. And actually what I'm going to do is form balls about an inch and a half and then pat them down a little bit. The original instructions do not say to flatten them, but I found it works better if you do. If you have little ones in the house, this is an easy dough for them to roll. They probably shouldn't be eating it because it does contain raw egg and also flour. So they need to be a little dependable in that and able to wait until they're baked. One way to make them of even size is to take all of the dough out on the counter and divide it into four pieces and then divide each fourth into, into pieces and just keep dividing until you have equal size pieces. We're ready to put these in a 350 oven for about 9 to 11 minutes. And when they come out, we're ready to do some decorating. And I've already made a few, so we'll work on the decorations right now. And this is where the melting snowman part comes in. Otherwise, they're just chocolate peanut butter cookies. We're going to put some white frosting on, on them. And this is just a white buttercream. It uh, can be homemade or come out of a can. Either way, whatever is easiest. Frosting is not difficult to make. A little butter, a little confectioner's sugar, some vanilla, and some milk. I'm going to add mini chocolate chips for eyes. And then half a miniature peanut butter cup will form the snowman's hat. Remember, these are melted snowman cookies, and so we need a carrot nose, and these are just little sprinkles, and I've taken out the orange ones. They were a Halloween mix, actually, with orange and black, so we're using them again for Christmas. And then these two melting snowmen will join their brothers on the plate, and that's melting snowman cookies. I have one more item to show you and this involves a yeast bread and I'm going to make a Swiss German bread called a Grittebans and my recipe made enough dough for two and I made one yesterday and this will be my second. And the dough has been rising in the refrigerator overnight. This is a, a easy yeast dough, but you could use a prepared dough that you purchase at the store, bread dough. This one is a little uh, on this has perhaps a little sweetness. I don't know if they sell roll dough. If they still have hot roll mix, you could use one of those. But again, we're going to divide this up into pieces, and I need one for a head and a good sized piece for a body and I'm going to make a little 
Santa Claus. And so I'm going to flatten this out, and I have a parchment lined baking sheet here. And this is so uh, we may need to add a little more for the body. We want a couple arms. So if you kind of plan ahead what you might need. And we want a head with a hat. We'll make that all in one. And I think we can put more into the body. But we need some dough also to uh, decorate with. So we'll add these to the body piece. And uh, you can work with this dough. It doesn't it's very forgiving. I mean, it isn't like pie dough where you need to be very careful not to overmix it. Bread dough gets kneaded and punched. And it's fun to form shapes with it. We're going to need these items too. And this is going to be our head piece. And again, I'll make it smooth. And then I'm going to pull out a piece for a Santa Claus hat from the top of it. So I'll make it a little cone shaped. And again, flatten it down and attach it to the body. And then we'll pull that hat over. Now remember, this is going to rise. So it's going to uh, pick up once again to twice the size it is now. So you kind of have to consider that. Then we're going to make some arms. And I can do that by rolling them. You could make a reindeer if you wanted with the dough. Uh, there are so many different things that you could shape bread dough into for a little holiday thing. I'm going to use two beaten egg whites or egg yolks, two egg yolks beaten with a tablespoon of water. And then this forms kind of a glue to hold these pieces together. And we'll paint this several times before we're finished. And I'll fasten some arms on. This will be both arms and hands. And again, as we go, we keep brushing. Once it rises, it will change shape a bit, which is always kind of fun to watch as this happens. But now we need to do some decorating on it. And I'm going to make a belt around his waist by rolling a couple pieces into ropes and braiding them together a little, twisting them together, actually. And we can twist this around this way. And twist it and stretch it. And I'll put it underneath the arm piece, actually rolling it all the way under for a belt, and we'll do the same thing for around to delineate between his arm and his hand. We'll just put it all the way around and pinch it tight. And we need to give him a face. I'm going to roll two little pieces and into circles for eyes. Try to make them about Cheerio size. Now we'll make a little hat band for him with two pieces of rolled dough. And again, fasten that well underneath. And a little piece for a pom-pom on the end of his hat. 
And then we have to make a beard and some feet. So, and some decorations. So, and take this piece and make a beard. Again, just pull it into the shape you want. And again, we'll use the egg yolk glue to fasten the beard around his face. Another piece for a mustache. A tiny little ball for a nose. And then I'm going to pat this out very thin on my counter space. And I have some tiny hors d'oeuvre cutters. And I figure if I have them, I should use them. So I'm going to make a few little stars. And I do have a toothpick. These, uh, you need to push out anything that you make. And we'll put a little few stars on his, to decorate his coat. Sometimes they don't come out. That's what I use the toothpick for. And I'm going to push it out again and use this little crescent cutter to make a, a mouth. And put that right there. And then we're just going to coat everything. Keep coating it with the egg. And the rest of the dough will become his feet. And I'll just divide it in half. Elongate it a little so I can push it underneath and give him two feet. This is a, a very fat little man. At this point, I can cover it with a clean dish towel. We're using a lot of dish towels in this episode. And set it aside. We'll set this aside to rise for about half an hour. It doesn't take any longer than that. You don't want it to fully rise because it will rise in the oven as well. And then we'll bake it at 350 for about half an hour. And if it browns too much, you can put foil over the top. It kind of depends on which dough you use. Uh, if it has a little more sugar and fat in it, it may brown a little quickly. Then just put a little foil over it before the time is completely up and it's finished. And then you have a Santa Claus bread. And we'll see that as we go into the dining room with our other things. Join me there. So today we did some holiday baked goods and we made a centerpiece, a basket, a wreath. Uh, this is our little man, our gritty bonds or bread man, snowman, melted snowman cookies, and a Yule log to welcome in the season along with the meringue mushrooms and sugared cranberries for a garnish. You've been watching this episode on NCTV. I'm Liz Davey. This is A Walk in the Garden, and this is our 100th episode of A Walk in the Garden on NCTV. It's really been a pleasure getting to know and work with everybody at the station, and I thank you for joining me here every week, or every month, not every week. Uh, look forward to seeing you again soon in the future, and I wish everybody happy holidays and a very healthy and happy new year.